Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to have Andover's coach, Terrell Ivory, joining us today. Now, Terrell, he grew up in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he did a post-grad year at Andover himself before playing at Davidson. And he went to Davidson to play football. After football was over, he laced up his shoes for the basketball team and played there the remaining uh, four seasons. So he did that, played a little bit professionally overseas, did a stint at Blair Academy for Coach Joe Mantegna, and then went back to coach at Davidson while Steph Curry was a young player there. So he talks about the Steph Curry experience, um, what it was like playing against him in practice, and then he coached at Colgate before getting back to Andover, uh, his alma mater, and he's been the head coach there for a while now. We talk about Andover. We talk about his experiences at the college and professional level, how he talks to his players about what he learned in college, both as a player and a coach. Um, he talks about you know uh, some challenges he's had in his life, which include a car crash, which almost you know took his life. And he talks about coming back from that, lessons he learned, and then we get into marathons. And he talks about uh, doing the Boston Marathon after you know he didn't know if he was going to survive the crash. So really good conversation with a really good guy. Hope you enjoy it. Thanks so much for tuning in. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights some battles I'm, I'm i'm not sure if they got us if they did maybe maybe so you will get better as a player during that year so it was kind of exciting like oh yes yeah, somebody wants me terrell welcome to the podcast thank you so much for having me i'm excited yeah good to have you here after knowing you for a long time and i want to start by going over your background a little bit and in high school you were a big time player in Charlotte, and then you decided to do a post grad year. Talk to me about where you learned about the post grad year, and then how you ended up choosing the prep school you chose. Yeah, I mean, I got lucky. Um, you know, you know, my parents were big proponents of uh, both of their kids getting a good education, um, and I had an older brother. He's he's about three years older than me. He was a really good basketball player. Um, I would never tell him this to his face, but he was probably a better athlete than I was. Um, and, you know, I, I looked up to him and, and sort of watched him do his thing for a long time and, and sort of wanted to be like him. Um, and um, he, my mom was sort of exploring opportunities for him. He had some, some offers from some, uh, some smaller division one schools um, that were sort of closer to us in North Carolina. Um, but my mom just had sort of this feeling like he needed another year. He needed some time. Um, and, and she learned about Andover um, from uh, from a parent of an alum. So uh, a parent, um, a friend of hers had sent um, one of her, one of his sons had gone to the school. And then I think his daughter ended up going there, but not before uh, my brother went. Um, but, you know, she he told her my mom about like it's the way they described it was it's the best school in the country. Um, and this is, you know, he'll get another chance to, to play whatever sport he plays at the time it was basketball and football. You'll have a chance to grow in a lot of different ways. Um, and my mom did her research, um, learned more about the place and, and my brother applied and, and ended up coming. And so, um, he had such a good experience. When it was time for me to do the same thing three years later, it was a no-brainer, right? I didn't even, um, and I wouldn't recommend this to anybody, right? But I didn't apply to any other schools. I didn't even know any other schools really existed other than the schools we knew about from my brother playing against them. Um, and then, our, you know, our rival school. But um, it just it just made sense. I was a, I was a good student. I wanted to play um, college sports um, and, and still sort of be able to, to play sports and, 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 and do well academically. And so um, I applied and, and got in and had an amazing experience. And, and I, you know, it was one of those decisions. My mom sort of made it for me. And it, it turns out it was like the best decision that she could have ever made for me. So. Perfect. And you ended up going to Davidson after that. Would you have had Davidson straight out of high school or was the post-grad year, did that make it more attractive to Coach McKillop and his staff? So they they recruited the one of the reasons why I, I I love my experience at Davidson and one of the reasons why I went there is because I watched them 
um, recruit Titus. They really wanted him. Um, I would go on his his trips. Um, I wasn't as good as he was. Um, so they really weren't recruiting me. And sort of in hindsight, they probably shouldn't have recruited me. Um, but what they did offer me is an opportunity for me to be closer to home. Um, I played football. I got into Davidson more because of the football thing um, and ended up playing that my first year. So I played football at Davidson my first year. Um, and I had a relationship with the coaches. They had watched me play, um, decided not to, to offer me a scholarship. Um, but they knew about me and they knew that like, I would probably be a little bit more of an attractive candidate after a post-grad year. Um, they still didn't offer me there, but they, they, they knew I was coming and I told them I wanted to try out. Um, and so as soon as football season was over, I, uh, I, I laced, I laced up my shoes and, and went out for the basketball team and, um, and sort of made the team. And then I, I just was on the team, um, um, for, for the, like my last, it's, I guess, three and a half years. So that half year I was on the team and then I ended up staying on the team until I graduated. Awesome. And then how did, how did Andover get you ready for playing D1 football and basketball? Yeah. I, I mean, Coming out of high school, like I, I felt like I was, I was prepared. I was in good shape, but like another year, right. Um, uh, you know, being able to play, being able to lift, being able to play against like better competition, um, like going to a public high school, um, was a great experience for me. Um, but, um, you know, when you come up to a place like this, like there are other people who are sort of dudes at their public high school, who are really good athletes at their public high school, um, and, um, one of the things that this place offered was, um, like the, all of these coaches and it's something that like, I think is really important now, all of these coaches, um, they may be coming to see our best player in the gym, but they have a chance to see like all the other players too. Right. So the exposure here, um, is sort of one of the key factors in what makes this experience, like from an athletic perspective, um, so attractive. And so, um, you know, I, I lifted a lot here. I had a lot of free time, like outside of classes and sports. And so like I had to figure out how was I going to use that time? Um, the classes here were, were more challenging than they were at my public school because the kids who come to this place, um, they want to be here, right? They're applying to be here because they know that they're, they're going to be challenged in the classroom. And so um, I had teachers here who who pushed me in ways that I had never been pushed before at a public high school because the kids at my public high school, like there were kids who like really loved school. And then there were kids, they went to school because they had to, but they didn't necessarily want to be here. Whereas everybody in the classroom here wanted to be here. Um, and so I, I think I was a better student. Um, I like outside of like the work that I was doing in the classroom, I went and got extra help when I needed it. Like I, I never had to do that um at, at my public school and so being able to to sort of develop that skill of asking for help and advocating for myself um you know academically but also outside of the, the class and with sports and things like that like um if i wanted to get better right um i could reach out to my coach he was right on campus and say hey coach can you open up the gym or coach you have time to shoot with me or you know if there were other guys on campus like i i tried to take advantage of all the opportunities i had at this place to sort of prepare myself as as well as i possibly could um for when i when i was no longer going to be at a place like this and i just think the transition in a lot of different ways whether it was in the classroom or outside of the classroom um, was just made so much easier because of um, some of the lessons and some of the things that I sort of, you know, adversity that I dealt with when I was a student here um, for that one year. Perfect. I love that. And I'm sure you tell that to yeah. the kids you're recruiting nowadays too, is all the benefits you experienced firsthand. Yeah. I, I, and I, and so like all the things that my coaches did for me, all the things that they helped me at with, like I, I work really hard to make sure I'm sort of providing those same benefits for the kids that come here. Um, and like they, once they get here, they, they realize sort of all of the opportunities they have um, and, and just trying to help them sort of find that balance because they can do a lot of basketball. They're certainly going to do some work um, here um, and that's going to help them out. But they can also do some other things that they may never have tried before, which I think is really cool. Um, I think you learn a lot about yourself at places like this. 
um, which I, I really appreciate. I love seeing sort of the the journey for for the kids who come here, like when they first arrive on campus versus when they're they're, they're leaving campus and, and sort of are, are ready to move on to the next step in their journey. Yeah, you're seeing their growth, which is great. Yeah. Um, yeah. When you got to Davidson and you started, you know, you laced up those shoes after your first football season, what was the biggest surprise to you about, about the D1 level of basketball? Um, that I was I was no longer the best player on my team, right? Um, and in order to to compete with those guys, in order to give myself a chance to to play and to contribute, like I had to like work really really hard um and it wasn't it wasn't just enough to 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 do what you had to do like during the time that you were you know you had practice <laughs> right like we you, you got to go watch film um you got to eat well um you gotta <laughs> this is something i never really worried about as much until i got to davidson like you, you got to get some sleep right um and it's like all of those things that sort of help you help you to be successful like you you really can't um sort of miss out on any of those things right there's so many things that lead to to success and like if you if you sort of mess up one of those things or you sort of um you know ignore one of those things like it could it could really it could be harmful to to sort of you, you trying to like have the success that you want and so it was and it was a lot of the little things right um and just and just being like prepared right um because um i wasn't i wasn't a i wasn't given a scholarship right away um and so i had to sort of earn everything that i that i i, I wanted like at that level and, and and doing the little things and taking care of those things um and like preparing and and and, and sort of being a a learner um and trying to sort of absorb as much knowledge as possible is like really really important but like the the eating the exercise the sleeping all of that stuff became just that much more important um in order for me to be successful and like the other balances like i also needed to have some fun right it couldn't have been like it, you can't just be like i gotta work 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 right you gotta have some balance um and and like remember how much i, I play basketball because i it's fun i love it um, and I wanted to sort of keep that perspective at the same time, you know, take it seriously enough to where people thought, um, they knew that like, you know, I wanted to do everything I could. And like, you know, I had to make a lot of sacrifices, right? Um, I went from, you know, in high school playing the entire game and at prep school at Andover playing the entire game. And I wasn't going to play the entire game at Davidson. Um, was I going to be frustrated by that or was I going to find a way to like, what and and it, to the point, especially my first few years, right? Um, I was like, okay, I'm, I may not play a lot in the game, but like, you're gonna get everything I have in practice, and that meant like that means um, even if I'm not playing as much as I want to in the game, like I was helping the team. Like if it, it was a, the starter or the or the the guy who was who was a backup to the starter, like I was gonna try my best to 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 make sure that like I competed hard enough to make them better. So if I was on the scout team, right? Um and the coach, you know, I would watch film and say, okay, the 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 kid from, you know, Chattanooga, right? Who we play in like a week. This is the way he, you know, he plays. I was gonna try to do that, right? Um and figure out how to make my team, how, how to prepare my guys, the the guys that were playing as good as possible. So um, and that that was hard because you know you, you know in in high school like I played a lot right and that was a part of like who I thought I was but when I wasn't playing like I wasn't gonna let that stop me from from helping make my team successful. Yeah, love it. And you know those little things you mentioned, Terrell, sleep, exercise, mm -hmm. nutrition, and we'll get into your D one coaching career here in a little bit. But like all that, you're now bringing back to your prep school coaching and sharing those tips with your prep school kids. So when they get to college, they're going to know about sleep. They're going to know about nutrition. Yeah. You're going to know yep. about the extra exercise. So it should not be as big as a shock for them with your experience you're bringing. Yeah. My, like I, I say that all the time when, when I'm trying to help under, help kids understand why um, a year at playing for me, going to a school like this will be beneficial. Um, like I want them to get to college and it's not going to be the same, 
but I want them to at least feel more prepared, right? Um, like if there's a, a, a long practice or an intense practice, um, I want them to, to say, hey, you know, I did that um, um, to a certain extent at Andover. So I'm, I'm prepared, right? I feel good about um, how I can handle um, what's, what's sort of being thrown at me. And so that, that, that is one of the main things that I try to, like, I want to win games. I want our teams to be successful. Um, but like sort of right up there with all of that is I want my kids to feel like, um, they've been there and done that. I want them to be prepared. Absolutely. Love it. Love it. Now, after Davidson, you spent a year in England playing professionally. Mm -hmm. What was the best part of that? And what was the worst part? Uh, I don't want to like offend the whole nation. The The worst part was, um, I, and not that the food was bad. It was just different. Right. Um, and so I had to get used to that. Like I, I, I ate a lot of like home cooked meals and things like that. So I, I miss, um, I miss that. Um, but the best part was like, I, you know, I was young, I had a car, I was playing basketball. Like that was my job to play basketball. And that's like, and obviously everybody wants to make it to the NBA, but at some point like that, that dream was no longer realistic for me. So I, I wasn't going to make the NBA, but I still got a chance to play at sort of a relatively high level, get paid. Um, and like, like I, I would wake up and, and I would sort of get the hard stuff out of the way. Like I got to go work out. Like I got to go lift. I got to do all this, this stuff. And then, I, you know, I figure out like, all right, what am I going to do with the rest of my day? Like, how am I going to feel the time? So I was able to travel. Um, I was able to, to, to experience a lot of different things. Um, you know, I, I tried to learn Spanish. I, I traveled to like different, different countries where they didn't speak English, um, where I could learn Spanish and just sort of be um, immersed in, in different cultures. So that, that was the best part, um, being able to just, you know, play basketball for a living, right? Um, but also find a way to balance all the other things that I want to do because, you know, I, you know, I love music. I love reading. I got, I, and I love like eating. Right. So I, I got to do a little bit of all of that. Cause you outside of the, the, the sort of a lot of time that you spend playing um, professional basketball, you got a, you got a lot of time on your hands and I was able to sort of take advantage of that. And I really, I, I really appreciate that. I sort of had that perspective, even, uh, you know, when I, when I was doing it and I didn't, I didn't want to have any regrets. Right. So when I was over in England, I tried to take it, try to do as many things as, you know, set a lot of goals and do as many things as I could while I was there. I love that. Cause you'll hear sometimes kids from America go overseas and they're just mad. They're not in the NBA or mad. They're not yeah. in the G league and miss, yeah. missing this family member or that girlfriend. And they're not present. Yeah. They're playing video games all day in their apartment and they, they miss yeah. out on, what you actually yeah. took advantage of. So kudos to you yeah. for having that mindset to take yeah. advantage of it. Mm. All right. You did that year in England and then you came back to the States and started coaching with Joe Mantegna at Blair Academy. Um, mm -hmm. So you did Andover, you played four years D one, you did a year professionally. What did you get out of your experience coaching with Joe at Blair? So I, cause the first thing I'll say about that is like, um, and, and sort of relationships are everything, right? Um, yeah. and, um, like I, I, I was, I, I'm lucky enough to know a lot of good people. Um, and I think, I, I hope people like, like me enough. And so when, when, uh, Joe reached out to, um, to coach Matheny, who was the assistant coach at Davidson at the time, um, and sort of described what he was looking for, right. He's looking for, uh, a, a young person that, you know, played basketball that, might want to get into coaching um and and you know <clears throat> sort of has experience maybe you know went to a boarding school or or you know just loves teaching right um which essentially is coaching coaching is teaching outside of a classroom right um and so um when coach Bethini called me i don't know if he thought like oh ti is gonna be playing for five more years but I, he kind of probably didn't think that because he saw me play a lot um, so he knew I was probably going to retire in a little bit. Um, but at that point, like, you know, my older brother was playing in Italy. He And I, I I wasn't watching his money, but I knew he was making a lot more money than me. Um, and so I was like, I need to get a real job, right? Um, this is not like how I'm going to make a living. Um, so when Coach Mantini reached out, like, I was like, this is perfect, 
right? Um, and I did some research and um, learned more about Coach Mantagna and just saw um, how passionate he was, how much he cared about um, the kids that he was working with. Um, and so for me, again, like I, I, I feel like I'm always um, trying to learn something and, and playing for Coach McKillop, was like unbelievable because I think he's one of the best teachers of the game, right? Um, and so it was sort of similar working with Coach Mantagna, right? Um, and what was what was great about working with him is like you could tell because he he was he knew so much more about basketball than I knew, but like at the same time he was interested in in sort of like my perspective, right? And he made me feel important in a, in a way that like I you know what was I 24 23 years old like he shouldn't care what I thought about like some of the stuff that he was doing but he did right and I think that's what makes him such a great coach right such a a leader of people um and so like I learned a lot um about you know what it was like to because the kids he was coaching, like they needed him, right? They needed his help and and sort of how to how to sort of balance um the needs and and sort of the desires of, of those kids. Cause like the whole team was good. Everybody wanted to play, but everybody can't play, right? Um, how do you help kids who are like especially if they're highly successful where they come from, sort of understand what their role is on in this in this new dynamic and things like that. Um, and then like this idea of like, um, how can you push them, um, in a way where they won't get so frustrated, they no longer want to play for you, things like that. Like I, I just, I learned so much and it's, it, it has to be, and I learned this from coach McKillop too, but coach, coach Mantegna was great with this. Like it, it's, it's always more than just about basketball. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, if, if there, if, if a kid, um, if, if, if parents send their kids to you and they're saying, hey, I'm trusting you with my baby, right? Um, like, it, you know, if, if everything outside of basketball is not going well, then how could basketball go well, right? Um, and so, like, there's this sort of this foundation you got to start with. And Coach Mantegna was great with that. Like, he was, he and Coach McKellar, they, he was he's, he's very tough on the, on the kids. The reason why you can be that tough, the reason why he could do some of the things that he did is because those kids absolutely knew that he cared about them, right? And to me, that's that's everything. So, like, you know, some, with some of the kids, it was more challenging. Like, as long as you care about me, like, and I, I think you know, you you I know you want what's best for me, then, like, everything's sort of fair game to a certain point, right? Um, and that, to me, like, I, I love watching him um, be really hard on some kids, but also understand when to let up um, and also understand, like, he, he just he knew what buttons to push and, and when to push him and, and, and how to motivate kids um, and then how to care about them when they needed it, right? Sometimes, like, you know, you, you want to motivate them, but it's, the timing's not right. And he just was a he was amazing. Um, so I really enjoyed watching him sort of do his thing. Yeah. Now this summer he'll be in Paris with the South Sudanese Olympic team. Yeah. Which is, <laughs> it's really which is cool. crazy. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah. So after Blair, you went back to your alma mater of Davidson to be the director of basketball operations and be back with coach McKillop. What was the best part about being a Dobo? And what was the most challenging part? The, uh, the challenging part was, um, especially at a, so I think we were in the Southern Conference at the time. Um, the most challenging part was like when you get to the end of the year um, and like everything is sort of riding on, you want to make it to the tournament, right? Um, and so as a coach, we didn't, we didn't make it. We didn't make it to the tournament. Now we, we played in a, uh, the NIT, which is really cool. Um, and it's cause I, I saw this year, a couple of teams opted out of that. Like I, for, I mean, I would never, right. I would never do that. Right. I was like, you, you know, if you have a chance to keep playing, you play, um, especially, you know, in such a prestigious tournament, but, um, that was a tough part. Cause it was like, especially when, when Steph was there, right. There was the, the these expectations, they, the year I came on, they had just, um, made it to the elite eight and then it was his, his junior year, um, 
and it what an experience right because he was <clears throat> everybody knew who he was people would like every game was packed our, our, obviously our home games were packed but people would just like um every away gym was was packed it was it was unbelievable he was like a rock star um but there was these expe- expectations right people um <clears throat> they were expecting us to like do really well and we did um except we you know we just didn't we we lost i think in the it's a bad memory, but we I think we lost in the semifinals to to College of Charleston in the in the Southern Conference tournament, which means we didn't have a chance to go to the tournament. Um, but <clears throat> we still took advantage of when we went to the uh, the NIT, and I think we beat South Carolina at South Carolina in the first round or something mm. like that. Um, but the the worst part was like the disappointment of not making the tournament, right? Because uh, <clears throat> you always feel like you put in all this work. Um, and that that sort of is the goal. And you don't reach that goal. But there are other sort of things that we accomplished that um, were great. But I, I really wish we would have made the tournament, um, especially that first year, Steph's last year. Um, the best part, um, and I, I got a front row seat, right, to watch, especially like in, in retrospect. Like, I mean, people always talk about, like, did you think he would be that good? Um, and the answer is yes. Right. And I, I got to like you got the you got a front row seat. You got to watch how he prepared. Um, and when you get to see something on that level. Right. Um, it, it sort of informs like what you do for the rest of your life and how you sort of and not that people can be what Steph was, um, but like to be able to sort of say like, hey, this is what he did. Right. This is why he sort of outkicked his coverage in the sense that he was like, you know, he was, he was smaller at the time. Um, he wasn't like, like a, a person who was like physically imposing. Right. But like, he just worked really hard. Uh, and on top of that, he was just a, a good kid. Um, and so um, I, it was, it was fun sort of, especially in retrospect saying like, you could sort of watch him, you know, be who he was at that time and watch him do his thing. Absolutely. Yeah. That was, you, you hit lightning in a bottle there with, uh, yeah, <laughs> with being yeah. there with one of the greatest players of yeah. all time, yeah. seeing him before yeah. he became him. So, yeah, uh, you then left Davidson after that year to go coach at Colgate. What were the main differences mm-hmm. that you saw between those two programs? So uh, it's funny because coach McKillop was a, a veteran, right? Like, and, and sort of well-known and, and sort of had sort of established himself um, as as you you kind of knew he was going to be a Hall of Famer, right? Even even before Steph, just because he had had like a really successful career. And so working for uh, Matt Langle at the time, he was. I mean, I know people knew who he was, but like um, he wasn't sort of as established as Coach McKellar. Um, and, and that was sort of, it was, it was nice because it was, it was sort of a, a, a new perspective, right. And a, a new way of, um, sort of understanding like, okay, we, you can sort of have the same goal, right. You want to win basketball games. You want your defense to be good. You want your offense to be efficient. Um, uh, but you don't have to do it this way. Right. Um, there are different ways. Cause when you, when you play for somebody and when you, you coach under them, um, you start to think, oh, well, this is clearly the only and best way to do sort of these things. And clearly that's not true, right? <laughs> um, and, you, and you can see sort of the origins of uh, the success that he has now um, then, um, when that first year, because I was only with him for one year. But um, I, I always say this, and I, I think because I, I want the world to be good, like I think good things happen to good people. Um, and you could tell that like he never was going to like compromise like his integrity or anything like that. He just wanted kids who worked hard. He wanted kids who were good people. Um, and they, they, they were, in a sense, taking a risk to go to Colgate at the time because, it, you know, they hadn't been great. Um, but like you could tell he was going to do everything he could do in order for that program to be successful. And it starts, you know, something I talked about is like he did a lot of the little things. Right. Um, like we, we, we needed to like if a kid wanted to work out, like you better you got to go work out. Right. Like you got to help these kids If they're asking for help. You got to go help them out. And I think 
um, like you could just tell because he was just such a good person because of how genuine he was. And like, I think he wanted good people around him. And that to me, like that, that leads to success. Now, how successful he is, I I don't know how he, I don't know what his secret is, but like, I think whatever he's doing, he deserves every bit of it because he's just, I, to me, he's just a, a unbelievable person who sort of, um, you know, I, you, I love seeing good things happen to good, good people. So. Yeah. And then after that year at Colgate, you then went back to your alma mater of Andover. Yeah. Yeah. And went back to being a head coach, uh, you know, for the first time in the prep school world. What yeah. made you want to, go back to NEPSAC? Uh, college coaching, I love it. Um, and like, I could have done it for a very, very long time. Um, it's just something about um, the the age group at a place like this, right? You're getting, you know, anywhere from 13 to, to 16, 17 year old, maybe 18 year old kids. Um, and those college kids, they, they they're, they're pretty mature. Um, they, for the most part, not that I had it figured out in college, but they kind of got it more figured out than these kids. Um, and like, I, I loved seeing kids sort of reach their goals and then continuing to, to improve once they got to college. But I felt like it would, I would feel better about helping kids get to that point as opposed to getting them when they were at that point. Um, and I know like how much the people at Andover, whether it was the coaches that I work with or like the other faculty members who helped me out with like non-athletic stuff with like life, life stuff. Like I, I knew um, that I, I think because I care about people that I could be good at that. And so working with kids and, and helping them sort of get from wherever point A is when they arrive on campus to point B, um, to me, like I just, I, it makes me happy, right? Um, and I get to know the kids that play for me, right? Because I spend a lot of time with them, especially during the season. But I also get to know kids that like will never play basketball ever in their life, right? Or they they may play JV and never play varsity basketball for me, or they don't they don't play sports, right? I, so I get to spend time with kids as a house counselor. I mean, kids in my class, I have an advising group of eight kids, none of them play basketball. So um, not only do I get sort of um, the benefit of being a coach here and helping out like the basketball kids, but I get to, to, to sort of be a part of other kids lives who, who may never play a sport, but I also, you know, I get to, as an admissions officer, right. I get to travel. Um, I know like the power of a, a, a good education. And I think this place, um, is amazing and it, it transforms people's lives. And so, um, helping kids, helping families through that process and getting to the point where they could to, to take advantage of this place. Like it, it, it means something to me because I know what these kids, um, how they change the world in a, in a positive way once they leave here. Um, and so again, sort of similar to what I said before, what you mentioned, like being able to watch that journey, um, it makes me, it makes me feel good. It makes me happy. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate that about this place. And I could do that to a certain extent at college, but in college, it, basketball was everything, right? Whereas at a place like this, I can do the basketball at, at a high level, right? But I also get to do all this, this other stuff and, and find other ways to, to, to help people out. Perfect. And you're, you're talking about Andover, the education, the experience you have, like, what's the pitch you give to families that are looking at Andover? Like, why should they come to your prep school? What do they need to know about it? Like, what's your elevator pitch? Yeah, so you got it. This place is um, the best of the best. It's not a good fit for everybody, but if it is a good fit, like you'll, it'll, it'll change your life for the better, right? Because um, you can't just come here and just say, I just want to play basketball. I just want to play this sport, right? You can't. Like those kids aren't successful here, right? You got to be just as, um, involved in, in, in sort of the other stuff, especially the academics, but also the other stuff like the people. Right. Um, and, and, and like, <clears throat> you know, I went to a public high school where everybody was from the same place and, um, you know, there wasn't, 
sort of much diversity of like thought and things like that. Like, you know, where I am now, like two weeks ago, I was in um, South Africa, right? Looking for, for kids from there to, 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 to help them sort of come to our school because that piece matters, right? Like when you're around people who aren't like you, when you're around people who don't think the same as you, right? Um, like that, that, that gives you an opportunity to grow. Um, and, and so, um, I want people to come here and, and, and take advantage of them. I want them to, to find success. I want them to be challenged. I want them to fail. Um, I want, I, I, and I want them to overcome, um, some adversity. Right. Um, and if you, if you can do all those things in a place like this, and this place sort of, um, provide you with the opportunity to do all those things I just mentioned, like, you're just going to be better off when you leave here. Um, and, and that's what I want. I want kids to come here one way. Um, and I want them to experience this place and then leave um, sort of better off, uh, better than when they came here. And I think, you know, if you it, it, the people I talk to, the kids that have played for me, the kids that like I've, I've been connected with, like they all leave this place. And it may not be like their first year, but they all leave this place and they feel um, like, like they're better off because they, they experience this place. Uh, so. Love it. Love it. And then, you know, there's a question I ask everybody in the podcast. I'm very curious since you actually did this, but what does it take for a guard to play at the D one level today, 2024? A guard, uh, the, the word that, 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 to the top of the mind, and, and I think it's counterintuitive, intuitive. Um, but to me, you just gotta be selfless, right? Um, and, and, and what I mean by that is like, of course you got to be able to score. Right. Um, but like it has to sort of make sense in sort of, um, in, in, in sort of the grand scheme of the game. Cause the, especially for college coaches, like they, they want to win games. Right. Um, that's how they, they, that's how they keep their job. And then like, based on how you, how you win games, like, I think a lot of good things can happen. Like you can you can, you can sort of do a lot of good things, but like, if, if you can't help your team win, right. Um, then like, I don't think you're very useful to a, to a college coach. And what are those things that you can do? Right. And, and I always talk about the, the, the things that won't, don't, don't show up in the newspaper. Right. Um, maybe in assists, maybe show up in the newspaper, but it's not the most glamorous thing. It's not like scoring, but it's like, you can, you can help your, help your team get 50, 50 balls. You can play good defense, take a couple charges. If you can, you can rebound well. Right. Um, and, and, and like, you can do like a lot of the little things, right. That, that have nothing to do with necessarily scoring. Um, then I think you can, you can, you can definitely, um, find your way on a, at least at the division one level, you can, if you can help your team win. And, and part of that is just, you just playing hard. And again, I, I'm looking at a lot of videos now, like my favorite player right now is, uh, and I watch a lot of like YouTube stuff and Instagram stuff. My favorite player right now is Ant Edwards. Um, and not because of how talented he is. And I, and if you ask me like MJ or Kobe or LeBron, like it's, I'm, Michael Jordan all day um, because he reminds me a lot of that, but like he just, the way he communicates, right. Um, the fact that he, he's a really good scorer, but he also plays really good defense. But the fact that he just like, he's a, he's an unbelievable leader. And, and I think he's doing it in a way that's different. He's not as intense as though as Kobe or MJ, right. He's always smiling. Um, and you talked about this at the beginning of the podcast, you said, we're going to have fun. Like, I just think, you know, if you, if you could play that way, right? Um, like, you're just going to get so much more done, right? Um, and so I think, like, having fun, doing the little things, and, and being a good leader are sort of the key ingredients in playing successfully at that level, I would say. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, I know that you did a marathon a few years ago. <laughs> yeah. I also have done a marathon and know what that's yeah. all about. And uh, yeah. it's it's a great great challenge. I love the training. I love the the things that pushed in me. What did you get out of the training uh, from doing that? Cause that was your first one, right? So I've, yeah, my first one's a few years ago. Um, and then I, I, I ran the, uh, it was a whole nother experience, but I ran the Boston marathon, which, 
um, running in front of all of those people and having them cheer cheer you on, it's it's like uh, I mean the the energy right is just like because at some point during the marathon you'd be like I I don't know if I can keep doing this but like um, you know that that motivation or all the signs like kids would have like little signs like a like a a mushroom from the the Super Mario games and like tap this for energy now you know you're not getting real energy from tapping it but like psychologically, like it makes all the difference in the world. Um, but for me, it was, I had just gotten uh, my car accident. Um, I broke my ankle, like people like were really worried that I was never gonna recover fully. And to me, I needed, because I had been an athlete, like I needed to set a goal for myself to say, and I don't know if I could reach that goal, but it wasn't about reaching the goal, it was about doing all the little things that helped me get to the point where I felt like I was making progress, right? Whether I got to the goal was one thing or not, but like the goal was like, all right, I, 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 need, I need something to help me feel like I'm gonna be okay, right? Because everybody was, including myself, I was worried. Um, that I wasn't going to be okay, whether I could walk again, whether, you know, I would, I would have like permanent damage, like, you know, concussion stuff and things like that. Um, Cause it was, it was a head injury. Um, and so I sort of set this goal, like, and I, I had been a, a little bit of a runner before, but like not long distance stuff. Um, and um, it's funny after you run a marathon, um, you realize like, Cause I, and, and that, so I've done other, like uh, some halves and like, I'll run a half marathon and, and I'll be like, there's no way I can run 13 more miles, but that's not true. Right. Cause I've done it before. Right. Um, and you realize how long that is, but it, it's, 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 it's less, it becomes less of a physical thing and more of a sort of a mental thing. Um, and that's what I needed. The physical stuff. I think I knew I was going to be okay physically, like mentally, like, you know, can I do this? And like, being able to do it and say you've accomplished that, um, it's it's really cool. Um, and and then like you're just like I don't know if there's an exact number, but you're always sort of faster or like you, you do better when you're running with people, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's the reason why I love playing. I love playing tennis and golf right now. Um, but like if I had to choose, I'd much rather play a team sport because accomplishing something like that with other people, I think means much more. And that's why like, if I had to just go run 26 miles or 13 miles, a half marathon by myself, it, it would, it's not as easy as doing that. Like if you're running like with people, um, which I think is cool. But that's the challenge I think is running by yeah. yourself with just you yeah. and yourself there. Yeah, yeah. That training was a beast. The training takes so much longer than the actual marathon. Yeah. There were like days where, um, like when it got, cause I, I use the, uh, the Nike app and like, you basically would run uh, a certain amount of miles on Monday. And then you would run double that on a Saturday or Sunday. Right. And then you would do like interval workouts in between, but like it got to the point where the Monday workout was like eight miles. And so Sunday you're like, I got to run 16 miles. Right. And you know, depending on how long, like you got to, you got to figure out like, all right, what am I going to run? Is it hot? Is it cold? Like, how long is it going to take? Um, and then I had, I never had an experience where I was like, I got to stop and eat while I'm running. Or I got to Like, I can't not drink water. Right. Um, and sort of planning all that out. It was, um, and then it was like, I tried not to run like a marathon planet when I had to train where it was cold, but sometimes you couldn't avoid it. And like running inside for like two hours, it's like, you know, you feel like you're a hamster on a, a, a wheel. It's like, it's the, it's the worst, but like, it's, again, it's discipline. Right. Um, so. I think I've read this somewhere trail that like a guy wanted to make it mandatory for everyone in America before they graduate high school to run a marathon. Right. Yeah. yeah. Cause here's the things it does. Right. One, you get in shape, obviously Two, yeah. you got to learn how to plan. Right. When, when you're going to yeah. do your runs and all that three, you learn how to, you know, fight through adversity because during all that training, yeah. there are days it feels great. There are days it hurts and it doesn't feel yeah. good. And then the sense of accomplishment you get when you yeah. cross that no, finish line, like really no one does. can take yeah. that from you and you've got that the no. rest of your life. Yeah. And if yeah. people go to a marathon, you see all ages, all sizes. Yeah. Um, 
you see people that don't yeah. look like they should be running marathons. Yeah. 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 So that's the beautiful yeah. thing about it too, that you don't have to be an ultra athlete. To no, do you it, don't. Right. No, it's pretty cool. I got one more in me and then I think I'm done. I think I'm going to run New York next year. So good for we'll you. See. Well, I tell you what, the first yeah. one was great because you don't know what's going to happen. But yeah. when I trained for my second <laughs> marathon, that was trickier because I knew it was coming, right? Yeah, yeah. And it yeah. was in Colorado, and so I had to train up here in the mountains oh, in the snow, God. right? Yeah, and crazy. guess what? It was during COVID, so I actually had something to keep me sane and healthy throughout COVID. But yeah. come race day, uh, a week before, they canceled it. And, oh, uh, God. So Did sh- you run anyway? Oh, no, I wasn't going to do one of those oh, virtual ones. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's so crazy. that that's But you trained for it, yeah. But I trained, and it was different because now I was like, oh, I know what that 18 mile run is going to feel like. I know what that 20 mile run is going to feel like. And on the second one, my 18 mile run, I didn't make it. Like, I think I made it 14 miles and I walked, you know, four of those 14. And I had to call an Uber and I was like, oh gosh. And it shook me. (laughs) But that's good. Like, I learned a lot from that day. It's like, everything's not going to go as planned always. So, anyway, I think it's great. Uh, for yeah. everybody. So yeah. last thing here, you know, you did mention your car wreck and how, you know, you almost took everything from you and you've recovered and, you know, running marathons and everything. What's the big lesson you learned from such a, such an experience like that? You learned a lot of different lessons. Um, I, I would say one is just, just be thankful um, because it can all be gone. Right. Um, and I would say a lot of, you know, sort of during my recovery, um, a lot of people who were really close to me, they stayed close to me, but a lot of people that I had sort of lost touch with, um, I reconnected with them um, because I just, I I wanted to make sure um, that they sort of understood, like, um, like I, you know, they understood how I felt, right? I wanted them to know how much I cared about them. Um, And to me, that was really important. And um, you got to take advantage of, 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 of sort of, you know, you wake up, right? And it's a gift. And then like sort of what you choose, how you choose to go about your day, how you choose to sort of uh, do things. And, and I try to, I, I'm not happy all the time, but like I'm, I am an optimist um, and I try to sort of help. I, I want people to laugh. I want people to smile. I want people to be happy. Um, and like, I, I think I'm a little bit old. I, I do that a little bit too much now because I, I just, I just know, like, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to sort of be in this, in this, in this space, be in this world and, 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 and just be, you know, regret anything. And so I, to me, I'm like, I'm happy. Right. Um, and I, I appreciate a lot more um sort of sort of understanding people and being like super empathetic and 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 sort of things like that i'm just I'm, for me i'm it's, i'm and i know it's sort of a little cliche but like when something's like taken from you and you can sort of you know see vi- not visualize because I, I i mean i was scared i was worried um that that things weren't going to be the same um, after, you know, sort of going through what I, what I went through and, and the fact that I was able to recover in a way where things are pretty similar to, you know, physically, at least, you know, what I was like before. So I'm, I'm just thankful, um, and, and try to sort of spread as much positivity as possible. Right. Um, you know, so that's the biggest lesson is just be thankful. I would say. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. We can all use that. You don't even need yeah. a car crash yeah. for, for that. Yeah. So, all right, we're going to finish up with some quick hitters here. Okay. okay. Best player you ever, ever played against. Steph. Easy. As okay. a dobo, um, being able to, to sort of, you know, whether it was like working out or stuff like that, I would say him, but like outside of the best play I played against in college, um, it was, I would say that like when we were actually competing would be like Jason, Jason Williams. Hmm. Okay. From Best Duke. player you've ever coached against both in prep school and college levels. Best player. Oh, uh, I'm going to say his name wrong. Uh, AJ, AJ Devoncia. That's the best player. Is that how you say his last name? I don't the know. Kid, I was going to ask the you. Kid, that's the kid who uh, they played at St. Seb's for a few years, and then he went out to prolific prep. Um, mm-hmm. But he was, I mean, he's just a, another level. So I would say him. 
What about when you were coaching? Was there one guy that that really impressed you? Coaching, um, who was coaching? Probably, oh, uh, Andrew Gudelock. He went to college at Charleston. He was good. He was really good. He had a like. I'm sure he he played on like some summer league team. He didn't play in the NBA, but he was he was really good. So okay, what's your favorite movie of all time? Favorite movie, uh, Shawshank Redemption. Okay. And lastly, what are your hobbies? Hobbies, I love playing golf. I love playing tennis. And I'm a big, I'm a, so I'm a Star Wars guy. I named my, my first daughter Leia. Um, and so like, I, I love either reading, reading those books or watching all of the, like they're the movies, right? Um, but then there's a whole bunch of like, um, animated shows. I like watching those, like the Clone Wars and, and um, mm-hmm. the Bad Batch and things like that. So I, I love that stuff. So, yeah. Perfect. Anything you want to talk about that we didn't discuss in, in our conversation today? I, no, not really. I mean, I, I just say how lucky I am that, that like I, I get to do what I do. Um, and, and I talked about sort of, you know, you know, recovering from the accident and things like that. But like, I have, I feel like I have the the best job in the world, right? I get to, I get to coach, I get to work with kids. Like I I just, you know, I'm lucky. Like I, I, I I will always like put myself in a position where I'm not taking that for granted. And I, I I try to remind myself and and humble myself and realize how lucky I am um, every day. So, um, yeah. Perfect. And if people want to reach out to you or find you on the socials or find out more about Andover basketball, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Yeah. So you can always email me, uh, T, um, Ivory, I V O R Y at Andover.edu. And then, um, what is my Instagram is T Ivory 1981, um, is my, my Instagram. So yeah. Perfect. Well, Terrell, it's a pleasure having you on today. Thanks so much about sharing your story and, and more about Andover. Thank you, Corey. I appreciate it, man. Yeah, and if you guys like this, be sure to subscribe on all the major podcasting platforms, subscribe on YouTube, and go to prepathletics.com. Get signed up for that newsletter so you don't miss anything in our monthly email. A lot of good intel. And any questions about the prep school world um, or basketball or recruiting, feel free to reach out to me coreyheights at gmail.com or find it on the Prep Athletics website. Thanks so much for tuning in. We'll see you next time. Take care.